Matt, you're not making any noise. <laughs> Matt's laughing and making no noise. Okay. Uh, hi. Okay, we're going to need to do some editing. <laughs> Nick. Okay. Welcome back from summer vacation, everyone, and welcome once again to Free Associations from the Boston University School of Public Health, the Public Health and Medical Journal Club podcast for anyone who is as confused by the latest health study as I am by the difference between the words flammable and inflammable. What is the difference? There is none. So why do we have two words? Don't know. I, I that always sound exactly the same. Wondered that. Mean the actually. same thing. Yeah, that's good. That's that's a good question. We should do a, a future episode on that. All right, we'll book that one. Maybe maybe inflammable is always within flammable. What now? To inflammable. It c- means it can be flamed. Um, Whereas flammable means it can be flamed. Correct. <laughs> that is correct. Okay. Anyway. Moving on. I am Matt Fox, Professor of Epidemiology and Global Health. I'm here with Chris Gill. Hello. And Don Thea. Hi, Matt. Both from the Department of Global Health here at the Boston University School of Public Health. Um, now, it's the first time we've had the, the gang back together in a long time. Did you guys miss me? We, I, we, uh, Sure. Yeah, right. Chris and I cried. <laughs> Jennifer did a great job. She did. She was wonderful. She did. But Made me feel you're, obsolete. You're irreplaceable, Don. <laughs> as well as inflammable. And... <laughs> I don't know about that. <laughs> Inflammatory, frequently, but... <laughs> All right. Well, Wait, so, I have a question. Yeah? Why is this the only podcast that I listen to, and I only listen to this podcast occasionally, that doesn't have ZipRecruiter mentioned really good every 15 it's minutes? A, it's a really good question. And the Cash App. Because no one wanted to sponsor us. Apparently not. I think we ought to... I'd like 1877 cars for kids. Plus, we're in public <laughs> health. You know, this, we're, we're, we're like paladins well, on white horses. I think we should go horses. for that. <clears throat> okay, anyway. We don't accept corporate sponsorship of any kind. No, uh, we don't. This oh. is from the American Academy of Pediatrics. This is very relevant. Thank you, guys. All right, go on. I'm wondering, did you guys have a good summer vacation? Yeah. Yeah, it was a little brief. Awesome. It's always brief. Yeah, it's always brief. Never long enough. Uh, so I did not actually get a chance to take a summer vacation this year. I spent my entire summer on the Population Health Exchange website. <laughs> have you guys been to this? You know how to live it up, man. Um, I'm impressed. How well, bi- how big is that website? Did oh, you like have to? It's massive. It's massive, and it's really really amazing. So, for anyone who doesn't know, this is the Boston University School of Public Health resource hub for lifelong learning, and there are so many great programs and tools that you can just get lost in it for an entire summer. Why is it called a, a hub? Ago. A hub? Yeah. It's the center of Because it's in Boston. Why is Boston called the hub? We went over this, didn't we? There's something to do with Longfellow, or is it Oliver Wendell Holmes Oliver, or some Oliver other Wendell Holmes. Well done. Anyway. A uh, reminder to our audience, if you could go ahead and uh, give us a rating on iTunes and all your major podcast apps, we would really appreciate it, especially Enter- if you're willing to write a uh, review. We uh, we love them. We- <laughs> and to our extensive list of seven reviews. Hey, seven. In- <laughs> Unless it's, a, it's not a five-star review, then you need not bother. Oh, okay. Well, no, no, I disagree. We, we, we are looking for biased uh, samples here. Okay. I'm pretty sure the audience is waiting for me to say, now on to the show. <laughs> Okay, so today in our first segment, which is our Journal Club segment, we are going to look at a study on the effect of smog on cognitive function. Then in our second part of our podcast, which is our deep dive, we'll talk about a move by European funders to ban publication by its grantee in paywall journals, meaning journals that you have to actually pay to access as opposed to open access. And then in our third segment, which is our amazing and amusing Don, we will get into some things that make us laugh out loud, or we will uh, find some new material for next year's best of Amazing and Amusing show, which uh, I hope you all got a chance to listen to. I had such a good time listening to that one. I enjoyed it too. It I fun. listened to it while I was driving from the Johannesburg airport to a place the called- Boston airport? Kriegersdorf. Kriegersdorf? Kr- something, something, some, some dorp. What? In South Africa. You went to Kriegersdorp. Dorp. Yes. Yes. I drove there in yep. my little rental VW yep. uh, and I listened to it the whole way. Well done. Yep. It's great. Okay. I'm going to... Any, anything you want to add to that, Don? No, no. All right. Let's move on. So let's get into segment one. We're going to talk about an article that looks at the effect of smog on cognitive function. The study was published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, Chris's PNAS. favorite journal. Chris's favorite. Not my favorite. I mean, I like what they publish, but I really don't like the style. Yeah, their but table we can get of contents that. is way too long. First author is Xin Zhang of the School of Statistics from the Beijing Normal University. Where they grade everything on a curve. <laughs> how, how, oh, no. how excited were you yeah, to I, get to do that? 
<laughs> it was actually pretty psyched. I wrote it in a note here. <laughs> We've been waiting two weeks Basic for that. normal university well, grading you know, on a they, curve. They, they asked for that. Uh, the study was entitled The Impact of Exposure to Air Pollution on Cognitive Performance. Let me give you some of the headlines. Um, these were, I want to say they, they were a little predictable. Is pollution making us dumb, says U.S. News & World Report. Mm. Study finds effect of high levels of toxic air equal to losing a year of education, says the Taipei Times. Huh, I must have missed that in the paper. Air pollution is making us dumber, says CNN. And our very own WBUR here in Boston says air pollution exposure harms cognitive performance, study finds. That's a pretty, that's a pretty good summary. Yeah, I agree. Uh, that, that, I, that I would go with. Much better than... Is pollution making us dumb? Or taking away a year of a year your of of brain, brain function or yeah. whatever you just said? I mean, there that, you that's... Don, let, 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 me, let me start with you. Can you uh, break it down for us? Tell us what, what they did in the study? Yeah, I can try. It was a, it was a bit of an uh, opaque study to try to, to figure out, but let me, let me give it a shot. So this is a study that was done in China. Um, let me just give a little bit of background first. There, the, the authors allude to research that's been done in the past that shows that air pollution has an effect, as most of us know, on human health, life expectancy, hospitalization, illness, child health, dementia. The overall effect on cognition is less well understood, though it's been looked at in sort of a short cross-sectional way in children, but it's mm -hmm. never really been looked at in adults, and it's never been looked at over a prolonged period of time prospectively. And that's what these authors attempted to do. And the focus, they're, they're from China, and the focus is really how this affects um, th those parts of the world that are most affected by air pollution. And they cite that pollutions, are, uh, the top 20 air pollution cities are all in low and middle income countries, and 98% of cities with 100,000 um, population or more in the developing world don't meet WHO air standards. So it really is a, a global issue of, 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 of great importance. Yeah, that statistic kind of blew me away. I, yeah. I, I highlighted that as well. It's a real, it's a real problem. Um, and that there are, uh, there are limits that they identify in other studies that they're trying to address, which were that they were uh, looking at the transitory effect of air pollution um, or the cumulative effect, but rarely did they um, uh, put those two together and try to control for one um, versus the other. So this is the first study they claim to study the effects of uh, uh, cumulative effects of air pollution while controlling for contemporaneous air pollution, because air pollution can be episodic or it can be um, continuous over longer periods of time. So what they did is they basically combined two data sets. There was one data set, uh, which is um, the China Family Panel Studies, in which um, a series of cognitive tests, both verbal and math, are given periodically to populations of um, people in various parts of China. And they're focusing on what they call the 2010 and 2014 waves of, of these test results. And what they did was that they matched up those test results for these individuals. And I think there was something like 15,000 individuals, 16, and, yep. 16, individuals and about 30,000 observations with... Um, measurements of air pollution, the API or air pollution index. So it's essentially try to match up what the results of these um, these cognitive tests f for verbal and math ability for um, what the level of air pollution was at the time that the tests were being um, administered or prior to that. So really how much exposure have those test takers um, had to air pollution in the, in the prior period of time. The air pollution um, index is a measure of the amount of sulfur dioxide, nitrous oxide, and um, uh, particulate matter under 10 micron, microns. So that's a, really a, uh, a measure of air pollution in terms of the amount of kind of dust or, or particulate matter in the air. Um, and they basically did a series of econometric analyses. And <laughs> we'll leave it to I Matt mean, really to try to sort of describe re that. Linear really regression analysis. Yeah, yeah, looking at those things. Why, why do you suppose they call it an, an econometric analysis? I was, I was puzzled by that terminology. I was too, but, it, you know. It's, it doesn't it's, have anything to do with econ economics. But. No, no, but I think it was the regression approach, wasn't it? Yeah, it was a linear regression. Yeah, yeah it's, I, I, I don't know specifically what falls in the domain of econometrics and what doesn't, but I don't think I don't think the terminology is something we should get hung up on. Mm -hmm. In essence, I think I think what this model did was allow them to um, to to include fixed effects like geography and socioeconomic status and some other things, while also entering in the main predictors, which is really the pollution and look looking at um, the outcome. 
Um, and they presented the data in, in, in a couple of different ways. One of the ways that they looked at it was they looked at the degree of exposure of air pollution with respect to verbal test scores and math test scores disaggregated by male and female. And when they looked at the difference between male and female on verbal test scores with um, one day exposure of air pollution, there really wasn't very much. But then they marched it um, along the, the spectrum for 7, 30, 90 days, one year, two years, and three years. And they found that, in fact, with a more prolonged exposure to air pollution, the test scores decreased in the verbal test scores, and they decreased more in the men than in the women, seemingly. Mm -hmm. um, when they looked at the math test scores over those same gradations, there was almost no difference from what I could tell, either overall in both genders or between genders. So it seemed as if verbal test scores were much more sensitive to the effects of air pollution, um, and in particular, prolonged exposure to air pollution, um, than were math test scores, which I completely <laughs> didn't understand why there would be um, such a difference. So that yep. was that was sort of the first presentation of the data. Second presentation of the data was looking at um, age strata. So they looked at um, the amount. They, I, I guess they 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 kept the amount of air pollution constant using this this model, and then they looked at the effect of different ages. So there were strata of 25 to 34 years, 35 to 44, 45 to 54, 55 to 64, and and 65 and over. And they showed that as test takers um, increased in age, um, their scores decreased. And again. That was seen in the verbal test scores, and again, more in men than in women. And by my read of these results, I didn't see that there was much of an effect on verbal test scores with increasing age in the women, but there was in the men. Yeah. And, and, can I just, just, and, and just let me just finish. Yeah, and sure. the same thing with the math test scores, um, as we saw previously, that there was no effect of increasing age on um, on the on the on the, the the test scores, regardless of whether you were a man or a I'm sorry, yeah, regardless of whether you were a man or a woman. Just to, just to clarify, so what you said makes is it sounds right to me, except that they were looking at the effects of air pollution by age within age strata for right. men and women, not the effects specifically of age, although right. it is an That's effect of age, say. but. But no, I mean, you said it correctly. It's just, I, I think, a little bit more nuanced. But anyway, go and, ahead. And then the last, the last way that they present the, day, the data were to look at um, the effect of air pollution on these age strata, um, stratified by whether the individual had a primary school education or above. Mm -hmm. and when, when they looked at people who had a um, primary education or below, it's at only a primary care education or less, um, there was a more pronounced effect on the verbal test scores, again in men and not in women. And again, the math test scores seemed to be unaffected by uh, pollution and um, by age strata as well as, um, as, well as educational attainment. Yeah. So, hmm. so what do we make of this? Yeah. It's a tricky one. It's we, a tricky we one. Loved this study. Well, I mean, this one. This, I mean, as I said, this one got a lot of attention, and so it seems quite important for us to to take a look at it. And yet, it's a it's a complicated one. I mean, this is this is not entirely straightforward. In particular, I just wanted to before I hand it over to you, Chris. I just wanted to make the the point that, and to an extent, this is a limitation, of probably of our collective toolkit as. You know, people who generally work on on dichotomous outcomes, not necessarily continuous ones. So we're not necessarily doing linear regression as much. But there's th these coefficients that they present. I don't know exactly how to interpret them. So is this essentially these these coefficients for the effects of pollution on verbal and math scores? The effect of one unit increase in bad air, bad air equating to one mm -hmm. unit increase in, or so, however many units increase in in uh, score in yeah. verbal maybe, and math score maybe, I mean, Matt, before before we get into that maybe it would be helpful if you describe kind of um, what, what what is a coefficient and how do we, how do we use a coefficient to sort of interpret it's what the these... it's the slope right 
I mean, isn't the the the, 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 the coefficient is essentially the slope? It's how much change in one as a function of the change in the other adjusted for you know other covariates. Is, is that, that's that's how I took it away from basic stats. That would be mine. No, no, I think I think you're 100 right in terms of the interpretation of what a coefficient is. But there are different ways you could present. You could present it per 10 unit. Pretend unit change. Right. I, there's no explanation and then they don't here. Explain it. I, I totally so agree. So I, I guess I have to assume it's a one to one. You know, one unit increase. One for every one unit change in air quality. This is the the betas here represent the right. change in math or verbal scores. Yeah. And so, if you look so, on so the, it's really a it's a correlation between the the risk and then the outcome in essence between the between the, the input, exposure and the exposure and the outcome, and the outcome. Yeah. right and the, and right. the problem that I have with with that is that I don't have a great ability to determine even if you accept the solid face value to determine whether you know is is how much air pollution change should we expect how much air quality should we expect and how much um, change in these scores matters. I mean, obviously, negative is always probably bad, but you know, does a, a a three unit or five unit drop in your verbal score meaningful? I I have no way of knowing. And yeah. part of the reason that I struggle with this, and what a, a general comment that I have about this article, is that I don't see the data in here anywhere. Mm-hmm. Even in the, even in the supplements. No, there's a beta, which is the result of a regression model, but I don't ever see anywhere what the mean values are of these these uh, scores over time. I mean, I, I, I think I mentioned to you all, I didn't actually even know what the sample size was for this study until I dug into the appendix, which mm-hmm. it, you know is a little sort of, the data isn't totally there and transparent. Mm-hmm. But anyway, I'm, I'm an outlier. And, and they, they also don't present the data on the degree of air pollution. That's so 100%. true. Yeah. That's the so data true. is not. Uh, I mean, we just know that it, that it was, it was, it was time duration of exposure to air pollution, but you know, there's, 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 Really well, minimal air pollution, and there's very, you know, maximal air pollution. Yeah, I mean the other the other comment I would make is that um, the uh, you talked about this sort of extending the window at which they were looking. So if I understood this correctly, they have a model in which they adjust for the current value of air pollution, plus they also include in this model a measure of some windows average air pollution. So it's right. not they call it cumulative. Like a seven a seven day window, a thirty day window, or yeah. a three year window, it's for the, example. It's the average value, which mm-hmm. I, I don't think really cumulative is the right term there, but it's right. it's, it's, it's right. a measure of sort of the cumulative, but it's not quite it's, cumulative. It's similar, but yeah. Yeah. Well I, I, I am so relieved to hear that the two of you were a bit stymied by this because I, I, I was thinking I must spend way too much time, you know, inhaling truck fumes on the mass pipe. <laughs> because I didn't get this at all. Um, and, and I was, as you, Matt, befuddled by the, the, the y-axis on this killer table one, figure one, where the, the, the decline in verbal test scores goes from zero to 0.18. What does that mean? Yeah, I, I, mean, I don't know. How many I mean, questions a, a are on this exam? Point, a minus, minus point one minus point yeah. one eight. Yeah. Right, to be so, fair, that, that, a I don't know what that means. A little bit that's a deficiency in us because we don't know the field, but I still feel like that could have should be that. exactly. I feel like that should yeah. have been come across a little bit better. Because I don't know, like you know, re- re- clinically, uh, is, is a point one eight. Is, is that like an SAT thing where that's like one <laughs> one wrong more wrong answer, or what are we what are we talking about on a test of several hundred questions? What is that? I got, they I got don't them. explain the exam ever, anywhere. I. Well, no, they actually did. There's a little bit in the appendix, but no. no. They actually said what they did is they they had they had they had words that were in an ordinal. uh, No, no, no. But like, what what is the structure? Is it like a hundred point? Oh no, 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 no. It's twenty three. They do say that. They do say that. It's twenty three. You keep keep talking, and I'll get you the actual numbers. But I believe it's so. It's a twenty three exam. Twenty what? Twenty four three three four. What <laughs> you're just saying numbers? <laughs> Twenty four five four 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 minus point seven seven. Excuse me, is the number? Are you giving me the codes to land um, the plane here? That, that that no, it's where the the detonator is in. Okay, um, I feel like so, I'm lost here. Uh, anyway, so I, I here they say they say the the uh, the, the ways 2010 2014 contain the same cognitive ability module that is 24 standardized mathematics questions and 34 oh, there it word is. recognition questions. All these questions are sorted in ascending order of difficulty, and the final test score is defined as the rank of the hardest question that a respondent is able to answer correctly. What does that mean? <laughs> what well, me- meaning? <laughs> I need the number. I'm sorry. I don't understand. It sounded definitive. If the, if the, I would assume it means that if the highest the question that you got right is the 23rd question, then you would get to 23. 
And so that what is that? Assumption. So I, I, what, how does that translate to minus 18? Minus oh, so this is the change. 0.18. That's 0. the change. Is that a percentage change? Are we talking no, 18% change? I think it's a unit. Change, I think it's a unit. Or are we talking about... 23 minus 0.1 <laughs> which is 20, 20, 22.72. I think we need a, we need a referee. Nick, I, Nick, what's your take? <laughs> no? None of the above. Okay, okay. Nick's not as, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a matter of, of paper writing pedagogy, <laughs> this is really complicated. It was, it was, it was so, tough, yeah. You know, um, but I'm, go, I'm, go, I'm not going to be overly critical because okay. I want to focus on the main high points, which are not so controversial. Um, you know, I think the what the study adds is that it, you know, in a lot of previous air pollution studies, we look at sort of, you know, more classic medical outcomes like cardiovascular death or asthma exacerbations or things like that. And here we're looking at really a functional, uh, a, a functional um, behavior, which is cognition, which you would imagine would fluctuate more rapidly based on the number of Starbucks and the number of diesel fumes you've had. There's some equation there that optimizes your what are you, you're looking so are you, are you are you saying bad things about starbucks no i love starbucks okay no i love starbucks they're you've been trying to get them on the hook to be one of our corporate sponsors oh yeah no, anyway so i i think that is it, it is not controversial but it is interesting to assume that not only does smog cause asthma and more mm-hmm. smog causes more asthma but that it also you know, impairs your ability to process language, mm-hmm. if that's what I'm understanding of this exam means. What I don't understand is why the effect is seemingly so uniquely selective just for verbal processing and, and yet does men. not seem to do much at and all for math, which I thought was counterintuitive because I, I, you know, I always struggle more with the computational rather than the verbal. So I'm, I'm, I'm that, that was like, huh, weird. I, I don't, I don't get that. I don't understand what the construct is now telling me. Yeah. Um, and the other thing is this, the sex dichotomy, which That's is why, why it is so much worse in the men uh, and not in the women. They don't really like explore this issue much. Um, but it does make me wonder, like, is this a description of the kinds of jobs maybe that the men have a different exposure? We're not talking about talking about like average air pollution levels in a given city, but like, what are you doing? Like, are, are you out working at a construction site next to the highway, you know, male construction workers to be a little bit stereotypical versus, you know, maybe, uh, work that does not involve direct exposure to diesel fumes. I mean, yep. that that is possible. Are, are there systematic differences between the kinds of jobs that men and women are doing in China? I don't know, but I can I can certainly believe that might be true. Yep. You know, so maybe the, that's it. One of the issues I have with that in terms of exposure is that what they said was that they were going to connect the data points of of the of where the the people were who took the test and the the measuring device for the air pollution but that they would allow up to 40 kilometers distance between where the individual lived who took the test and where the measurement device was so so that's like the you know the 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 individual taking the test could be in downtown Boston and the measuring device could be as far away as 495, almost to Worcester. And right. so the question is, is <laughs> that, is that, does that, our audience know what that means? Right. So the, there's going to be some from Togo, probably <laughs> Suriname, probably is not familiar with those references. But what you're saying the point is, 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 why would you want to go to Worcester? There's, there's misclassification, of it, potential misclassification could exposure, could which would drive it to the null, right? So we're, it would render these results a little more conservative. I would, I, I would assume if they're well, misclassifying possibly, the exposure. Possibly, but I think you're onto something, Chris, which is it is possible that the misclassification is different for men and women is what essentially what you're saying because yes. all this is is a measure of the air quality. It's not a measure of how much of that you negative personally exposed to air quality you are personally exposed to, and that may be differentially uh, the the classification the error in the classification may be different for men or women depending on occupation occupation socioeconomic status. You could come up with a number of things mm. that might explain the differences. Mm. Maybe more of them are, are, are raising children or staying at home and are indoors rather than the, the outdoors. Sure, whatever it is. Who knows? Whatever it is. I mean, you, you know, we know that when there's a, you know, in California, when there's an ozone alert, what they tell you is if you have chronic asthma or bronchitis, COPD, you should stay indoors. Yeah. And so, you know, does I, I think one it would be a great question to actually uh, ask, you know, it's future pod, does staying indoors help? protect you against ozone because yeah. I would have assumed I that ozone can get through. It kind of depends you know, on what you do indoors, doesn't can it? Can get 
can get in, right? Because the air gets in. So why can't the ozone get in? But that, that's a separate question. Um, <laughs> so, I, don't, I, don't, I don't understand why that works, but you know, that is what they recommend that you do. Um, Maybe staying indoors and playing video games helps. Or not being physically active, you mm. know, that would, right. Anyway, it, th so I thought that that, you know, in a sense, what they have done is presented data that there is a, a long-term consequence in terms of cognition, uh, you know, based on these these three year yep. average exposures, yep. that that is bad for you, but that a short term exposure is also bad for you. But that the short term exposure seems to be less than the long term exposure, which I guess makes sense because more poison seems worse than less poison. Yeah. But I, I but I know even that I found a little bit difficult to wrap my head around because, you know, when you're talking about someone with a seven day exposure. In reality, that person we're just we're just truncating the analysis around seven days. It's not like they haven't been breathing the air outside for the last ten years, You're right? I mean, we all have a cumulative life exposure. No, no, but, but but the fact that you get different estimates and the effects get more pronounced the longer you make the window, the longer back you look, suggests to me that there's a lot of variability in in air pollution levels. And so for some people, that seven-day window, you're right, they're being exposed for the past three years. But for some of those people, they were exposed a little in the past three years, and uh -huh, some of them were exposed yeah. a lot. Yeah. It suggests to me there's a lot of variability. Again, the main the, the reason why I'm frustrated so so the that we don't have the data is, to be able to see. sensitive to the spikes, right? Is that what you're saying? Yeah. But yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and so, you know, hard to know what to make of it. Hmm. Needs more work. Needs more work. Um, a couple of things I found... Interesting. They they did a bunch of um, falsification tests. Yeah. Right. They did sort of these analyses to try and th they're not quite, but I think of them in the category of of like negative controls, where you're looking for something to that you would expect not to be related um, as a way of of saying okay, if these are not related, then it would suggest that that uh, and I expect them not to be related. Then if I observe something then that is probably more likely to be true, um, which I found uh, useful. I mean, I, I, I wouldn't say they were amazingly convincing falsification tests, but they were certainly better to me than, than not doing these. And I, that's something we, I don't think we've come across in any of the studies we looked at before. So they, in the, right in the abstract, I mean, they, they don't beat around the bush here, right in the abstract and all throughout the language of the paper, so this statement is from the abstract, we find that long-term exposure to air pollution impedes cognitive performance in verbal and math tests. So they are right out in front here saying this is causal. And I am... You have a problem with that? I'm... Well, it's not that I have a problem with causal language, but I, I, I'm not convinced here that we are necessarily sure that we have the causal, the causal effect. And I, I or, you know, I just, I, I was, I was concerned about the, the mm -hmm. casual use of causal yeah, language here. Yeah, far from it. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. Totally agree. Mm -hmm. Any other any other points anyone wants to make? Um, well, there was one um, there was one statement early on in the in the paper. You know, this is this is P N A S, mm -hmm. and and so they have this funny way of sort of like spreading out the the methodology it's, throughout the results. Yeah, uh, not, it's the, weird. It, it, it you is start a, off it, arguing. It, it's for kind why of you're leaping around, your results. right? Yeah. Um, between what we would sort of like, we, we used to sort of we're we're come accustomed to seeing it split up very cleanly. We're used to introduction. Methods, methods results, results discussion and then yeah discussion this seems like the opening paragraph is and therefore it's causal it <laughs> is sort of a introduction slash results slash yeah. conclusion it's a much more integrative in some ways it's 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 meant to be read because they're sort of you know handing out little bits and pieces of the methodology as they go it's like a good novel but it is it is also a little bit confusing because sometimes you wish that they would expand a little bit and there was this statement here where they they talk about uh, I'll just read the quote. In this study, because we have access to a longitudinal data set, the China Family Panel Study, CFPS, we can remove individual level unobservable yep. factors. And I was like, huh. And I'm, I'm thinking, chewing on this. And I think what they're saying is that because they have repeated measures on individuals, yep. that they have, that each individual controls from their own confounders. Is that which what they is, meant? Yes. Okay. Which is correct for time fixed confounders. But not for time variable confounders. But not for time variable confounders. Right, right. So, uh, okay. So it's, I mean, it's a strength, right? So it's so a the robust, fact that it's, it's, they, it's they are validity. using these, these, mm. these time, you know, they're, they're comparing it not just to a uh, person's uh, cross-sectional measure of their verbal and math scores. They're comparing the change in verbal and math scores over time. So the comparison is with an individual. You are, you have some ability to control the, 
the, it's like a crossover design mm-hmm. almost, mm-hmm. but it only controls for the time fixed confounding, not for the time dependent confounding, that time varying sense. confounding. That totally makes so. sense. Just one more point. Yeah. Um, in reference to the issue you raised previously in, in regards to um, the relation to polluting occupations. Mm-hmm. They have a section which they titled Robustness, which is really kind of a sensitivity analysis. Yep. And what they which did they is did they, they excluded those occupations were, which were considered um, polluting and, and determined that the results remained robust to that. So, Matt. That's it, me. It, if, <laughs> if you let, – let's imagine that, um, that there is a, uh, an interaction, a, a synergistic interaction between outdoor air pollution – and other pollutants like tobacco smoke. Yep. Um, so like, you know, out, you know, smoking a lot and also being exposed to diesel fumes is worse than either alone. Yep. Now, supposing that the, the cohort of men on average smoke a lot more than the cohort of women. Yep. Could that be another reason why this would show up as a, as a sex associated, you know, interaction that there's a, there's a, a depend how, what, what's the term you often use? Um, a mediation, no moderation, moderation. Thank you. Um, could that be, could that make sense? Even though based on this analytic structure, they, they would be controlling with the individuals for the presence or absence of smoking. But if the individual well, smoking could change over time, well, let's say it's, it's a constant. Okay. So like in all periods, they're smoking two packs a day. Even so, that individual you would think would have a yeah. c- more cumulative effect of, of 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 pollution because tobacco smoke is essentially a pollutant. Absolutely, sex could be a proxy for some other effect modifier, right. which I think is what you're getting at. Outdoor occupation yep. or other things that you do that might harm you. Yeah, in that absolutely, similar way. certainly could be. Okay. Yep. All right. I think we can leave it there, and we can move on to our second topic. So our second topic, we want to uh, talk about a new policy that was reported on in a paper in the uh, journal PLOS Medicine, I believe. The new policy by EU funders to ban its grantees from publishing in paywall journals, by which we mean journals that require a fee for the end user to access the article, uh, as opposed to ones that could be free. So if we're in the era of open science, the idea being we want, if, we're, if we, the funder, are going to pay for this research to be done, we want it to be access, as accessible as possible. So we want it to be put into a journal which is, is open access, in which anybody in the world could go onto that website and access that particular manuscript. Um, and it would just make me feel worse, though, that people are still not reading my papers. Yeah, that's a good point. If there was a bigger audience I and say, they're still oh, not reading it's behind the firewall. That's why no one likes me. Yeah. That's why Chris gets no citations. Right. I'm going to come back to that. Too many published publications in the New England Journal. I've done uh, myself in. Now, so the, the policy does not forbid, as far as I understand it, does not forbid the grant from paying the fee that would be used to make the, the publication open access. It only bans publishing in journals that don't allow, don't have this open access. And my understanding is they even preclude publishing in these hybrid model journals where you can you can pay to have your article open access, but people also are paying subscription fees to the journal. And these subscription fees are, are incredibly high, which means that essentially, really, if you're not, uh, fu- not at a, a university, you're not going to be able to access many of these, many of these journals. The subscriptions are, are incredibly high, and the fees, I think, for individual articles can be $30, $50. Dollar. So mm-hmm. you're really saying that that your um, your article isn't going to be read by very many people. So this would include would this include like the Lancet? Yeah, I, I think it would include the Lancet. I, I think it would include New England Journal of Medicine. I think it would Science, include Nature, Nature. And Science. Yeah, all so the top pretty much journals. all the top journals yep. would would be in would be in uh, off off um, yeah so off this, limits. This could have this could have a, a huge impact. I mean, presumably it's designed to force. Uh, those top tier journals to make a decision about their funding models going forward as to how they're going to deal with this. I mean, obviously the EU is a, is a major player, but but if the NIH were to or the NSF were to make this policy as well, that that really would have huge implications for these top tier journals, and it has implications for people who are wanting to publish in those top tier journals. and And so I think there's a, a potential for a lot of different things to happen. So can I? Is it? Did I describe the first of all? Did I describe the policy sufficiently and in enough detail? Would you say mm-hmm. anything you want to add? No, before but, we get but into it, the implications are 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 
uh, profound if this goes forward. I would agree. Uh, yeah, I think that's, I, I think we're we're about to see a real knife fight in Europe yeah. if this goes through because this is really under undermining the basic business model of um, you know the Science Publishing Group and the Springer Publishing Group and and they're I think they're they're scared. And, and I, would not be happy about this. No, not, not at, at all. all. No, they've expressed the fact that they're not happy about this. You know, and and it, I, I, it's big it's big money. You know, it's big it's money. A huge business evidenced. If by no other fact than that we, as we've referred to previously in these podcasts, are getting inundated with um, with these journals that will publish anything as long as we pay them two thousand dollars to publish a, a particular article. So there's there's a lot of money at stake out there. I mean, it is mm-hmm. such a strange to start with. It's such a strange business model to begin with. So mm-hmm. we, as researchers, go out and write a grant. We get the we win the grant. We then do the we have a team. We do the research. We write up the results, and then we hand it over to a company who now takes that and uses it as a, a way to make money. They own it, in they fact. They own it. They own the copyright. We have right. to sign over the copyright to right. them in most cases. And very frequently, we, so we pay them to do we this. We have done all the work. Right. The funding agency right. has paid the fees. Right. And, and, then, and then they ask us to review it for free. And then they <laughs> ask us to review it for free. It's a bizarre thing that we are are in this. Now, I obviously, they're... You know, you could say, let's just get rid of journals. There's a whole bunch of reasons why journals do a lot of things that we actually value and need. But are we recommending that we get rid of journals? No. Uh, no, I mean, but there are people who toy with the idea sort of as like, if we're in the internet age and anything could just be put online, why do we need journals? And I think there are good reasons why we do need journals. So the question I have for you guys, and, and we can get into the the potential implications of this policy, but assuming that we all agree this, do we, do we all agree this is a good idea that we're open, happy open access. Th- open access. to see this policy? And that we would, might even like to see U.S. funders go the same route? Yes. Chris? Yes. Ethically, yes. Okay. So if that's the case, uh, what do you think are the and – and I would suspect the vast majority of researchers would agree with this too. Yeah. I, I don't know that, but that's just my hunch. So the question then is what are the, what are the unintended consequences here that we think might come out of this? Because this strikes me as not particularly controversial within the research community – very controversial for those who are currently making money off of this. And whenever there is money at stake, people react and they, they find ways to continue to, to try to make money. So I'm just yeah, wondering you know, what I the, think, I think one of the unintended consequences, not thinking through one here? of the unintended consequences might be that if these top tier journals that make money through their subscriptions and through their advertisements can no longer make money through their subscriptions or by selling individual articles, um, to individuals for fifty dollars or forty dollars or whatever, they're going to make up the re- the revenue with advertisements. And I think when you start f- bringing in those forces, it it has an even more um, likelihood of corrupting the process. Mm-hmm. So 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 are you are you? I mean, so obviously journals in print form have Adver- advertisements in them. Some do. I, I don't know if they all do. Right. But some do. Right. Mm-hmm. No, many, many, do. many do. Jama Lan- does. But Lancet when you does. download... BMJ does. When you, does. But BMJ when you does go not. Di- no? No, BMJ does not. But when you go directly to the, to the online version and our university has a subscription, we don't... I don't see... Advertisements. That's because that we're case. just looking online, right? That's what I mean. But yeah. if you get the print version, you see Does like, anyone the first read 20 print? pages Does are just drunk. Does anyone read print journals anymore? Um, for the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> no, we print out. We don't read print. Well, they, they show it, up in my mailbox, and so I do kind of troll through those. It's getting articles. more and more insidious. So, it's getting more invasive, like all yeah. advertising and all you know, all internet apps. It's getting. So you that's know. what I'm asking. So is, is it going to be like sort of figure one, and then next to figure one is going to be an advertisement? For <laughs> <Reference you. laughs> that's right. Yeah, <laughs> no, that's true. Or, or cards for kids. Are they gonna, every third word is going to have to be Tylenol. Yeah, right. Yeah, right. You know, and the, and the reason Reading Product pa- placement. Reading- you can pay to have oh words in your... No. God. No, we're not going to go there, are we? Yeah, no. Well, I, I mean, that's a potential unintended consequence. I assume that's going to be banned by funders as well. But anyway... Well, I think the more likely thing oof. is that they're going <laughs> to... I hate to say it, but the, they've, they've already exploded this business model where, as you point out, the, the, it's the researchers who paradoxically are paying for all of this. Yeah. Even though we did all the well, work. it's the funders. It's the funders. Okay. okay the researchers they're, are doing they're the gonna, work. They're going to... You know, I think the journals will will offload this extra cost back onto the onto the funders and the researchers again. Yep. You know, and it isn't just the funders because you know I 
and you and Don, we have all been in the situation where we've had a funded grant, which ended, and then along comes yeah. like you know, happy medical student number three who wants to do a summer research project, and they write a paper, <laughs> right? And 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 like, well, hey, you found something really cool. Let's submit it to Journal X, and they're like, now we've got to find the two thousand dollars when right. when the paper, lo and behold, gets accepted. Like, right. where does that money come from? Right. It comes right. from my faculty development account, which seems like. Rather unfair, to be quite frank. Yeah, I mean, someone's got going to have to pay one way or the other for the service of peer review, for formatting, for you know all the things that journals do. The question is, how much should that be in an open access world, and what is it worth? I, I personally, those of us here in the Tostitos studio are totally fine with uh, adding all these advertisements in. So. Some some of these these open Tostitos access journals. Tostitos are we not studio? the Tostitos studio? Are we not? Uh, they charge a mint. Uh, I don't know. A Mentos. Oh, excuse me. Mentos. Saying, Mentos. We're going with, with product placements here. So Mentos. Um, this is some fresh. really nice Poland Springs water, it don't you think? Refreshing. <laughs> anyway, I was going to say that some of these journals, they really charge an arm and a leg for this open access stuff. It was like 5,000 bucks for one of my recent papers. I, I know. Mean, I was flabbergasted. It's it's terrible. Mm. And I had to do my own copy editing. I was like, wait Seriously? a minute, what am I getting for this? Yes. They charge you five thousand dollars and, and I you have still to do, had well, to like edit the Jesus plus, out plus of it and do that, all sorts of it was it you know, it does feel like like you know, editor, one step away from highway robbery. And the editors don't get paid either. Some That's do. True. You know, reviewer, Some do. reviewers don't get paid, but but the editors who organize all of the all of the reviews, they don't, they don't get paid either. Some I mean, do, it's a, but some don't. Yeah. It's it's just a scam. I, I got a letter saying thank you for being such a great reviewer, which was a, a signal to me that I was doing too many reviews. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. So okay, fair enough. So I think we all think this is 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 a good idea, but it has the potential to to lead to some harms that I think need to be kind of thought through. Mm-hmm. And uh, don't I'll be, be too hasty, to European Union folks. Well, no, I mean, I, I want them to, to implement this policy. I do think it's, it's good, and I, I, you know, I'm, I'm supportive, but I, I don't know what the unintended, unintended consequences are. Mm-hmm. All right. So can we move on to our third segment? Mm-hmm. So in our last segment, which is our Amazing and Amusing, we want to highlight some of the things that make us enjoy our jobs even more than we already do, a look at those weird and wacky studies, those things that happen in our field that uh, make us laugh or just inspire us. Uh, Don, do you, you're yeah. ready to go first? Yes, I am. Take it away. All right. So uh, I ha- this is actually from a um, article that was in the Washington Post, August 13th, um, in speaking of, the Speaking of Science article. And it um, abstracts a number of experiments. But um, they refer to work that was done in 2015 by Dasher Keltner... And an, uh, Paul Piff, psychologists at the University of California, Berkeley. And they have spent decades studying wealth, power, and privilege. Wealth, power, and privilege. Right. And so what they did was that they tried to do, um, set up natural experiments and try to determine if there's a relationship between being wealthy and human characteristics that are not so, uh, so well thought of. So in one experiment... They stationed themselves at a busy intersection with a four-way stop sign and tracked the model of every car whose driver cut off others instead of waiting their turn. Ooh. And it turns out by people- By car. By pe- car type. By car type. People driving expensive cars like brand new Mercedes were four times more likely to ignore the right-of-way uh, laws than in cheap cars like an old beat-up Honda. I believe it. Then they did another experiment where a researcher played a pedestrian trying to cross a crosswalk and tracked which cars stopped as the law requires and which blew right past him. And the results were even more stark. Every one of the cheapest cars stopped (laughs) (laughs) and half the expensive cars ignored the pedestrian in the crosswalk. Many, even after making eye contact. Wow. So this is entitlement. Yeah. This yeah. is this is how being rich gives you entitlement. I don't like it. Um, and the, apparently, uh, th- there was uh, rich cheat more on taxes. They cheat more on their romantic partners. Um, the wealthy and better that? educated are. This is sort of a summation of other work that of people other have done. Work. Okay. Wealthy and better educated people are more likely to shoplift. They're more likely what? to cheat at games of chance. They're often less empathetic, and in studies of charitable giving, giving, it is often the lower-income households that donate higher proportions of their income than middle-class and many upper-middle-income folk. 
Hmm. So uh, they they summarize the, sort of the, the all of the effects of this by quoting um, the rapper Biggie Smalls. Oh, Biggie, who reached a similar conclusion before his untimely death. Quote: "Mo money, mo problems." <laughs> Biggie. Wow, I like that. There you go. That's 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 a good one. That's pretty cool. Uh, I no, mean, it's sadly no, it's not true, cool, right. but it's, uh, it's interesting. Right. Body of research. All right, Chris, what do you got for us? Well, I I, I had originally found this paper in Nature, uh, which is called "The Genome of the Offspring of a Neanderthal Mother and a Denisovan Father." Oh, um, and, and I, yeah, and I, read, I that. read it with great enthusiasm, thinking that I was going to talk all about this, uh-huh. but it, it, it became very complicated very quickly, and I I, I couldn't understand it. Uh-huh. So I'm, it's like the bees that can't count that can't can't count past zero. The, the bees that have back scratchers, or the bees that <laughs> that's can't a different count, article. The bees that can count to zero. The bees that can count to zero, but not beyond. Got it. And I was I would just like to point out that I can do that too. I don't think the issue was they couldn't count beyond. <laughs> oh, drat. So anyway, um, to, uh, to summarize this paper in one word, there was this, there's a cave in Eurasia, and they found some word. skeletons. Uh, and in the skeleton, there was some skeletons that came from Neanderthal lineage and some from Denisovan lineage, which is like... Western Eurasia as opposed to Eastern Eurasia. And then there was a fragment of a tibia of a um, of an individual who turned out to be a 13-year-old girl uh, based on looking at the thickness of the cortex of the bone yeah. that had a 50-50 mix of Neanderthal and Denisovan. And they're like, okay, well, that could be because she came from a, a blended set of parents who also had 50-50, and then she would also be 50-50. And then they did some complicated genetic analyses, which I could not understand. But it turns out, no, she's the daughter of a Neanderthal and a Denisovan. So this was a mixing of these two rather disparate lineages of, of early hominids. Anyway, um, that's since that's all I could get out of it, I, I found another paper this morning, which uh, I, I'm going to summarize and said, which is actually from our pal. <laughs> How'd he slip two in there? John Ioannidis. Mm-hmm. Um, Go ahead. Who uh, wrote an essay here with uh, Kevin Boyack and Richard Clavins called The Scientists Who Publish a Paper Every Five Days. And you found this all on your own. <laughs> Um, I did. That's amazing. This was also in nature. That's amazing. That I found this on my own? Yeah. <laughs> well, and and well, that's from the email I sent you yesterday with that article in it. Did you send me this? <laughs> <laughs> that's twice in two days that you've sent me an email and I've did ignored you it. Ever read, do you ever oh, read Matt's done, emails? Done. No. <laughs> Don, you're not Matt, allowed to do that. Don't, don't develop a complex. It's Go not ahead. what you think. Go. Anyway. <laughs> so This was going to be an in-depth segment in a few weeks. <laughs> so there's, there are these this sort of elite cadre of researchers out there, uh, which John and Richard and Kevin called hyper-prolific authors, which would not include us. the three of us. <laughs> Right. No. Who have is there, like, is there a category of sloth published authors? Published thousands of papers, yep. and this this is one guy. The guy who wins the race here is a, a, a Japanese uh, materials scientist called Akihisa Inoue from Tohoku University, and he has published two thousand five hundred sixty six full articles in Scopus. How many? Two thousand five hundred sixty six. That's impressive. Now that's what they said. That's impressive, but they also said, "Come on," because if you do the math, they're like publishing a paper every five days, and that does seem a little bit like how does how do how do mere mortals do that? Yeah. He's on a streak. Um, he he's been on a streak for a decade. It seems <laughs> more than a streak. Yeah, he doesn't sleep. So they 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 trolled Scopus, which is one of these online uh, databases for papers, and they found all these guys who had super high uh, publication rates. And then they noticed that a lot of them were from like particle physics, where they have a thousand authors on a paper. And so they're like, okay, that is a different publishing model. So we're going to get rid of all of those because that that's clearly just the particle physics people. Everybody cites everybody, and everybody's on everybody's paper. And so it's just like that author. It's like a cast. It's like Cleopatra. Wait, what now? Or El Cid. You know, the, the classic movies of Cecil B. DeMille back in the day where they had casts of thousands. Yeah. So, you know, Leslie knows. Okay. It's a great movie. Great. Okay. But <laughs> getting rid of the particle physicists, then you have like the Chinese and the, the Korean authors where the problem is disambiguation of very common names. Like Zhang. We had we had two authors on today's yep. paper called Zhang. And so it is is really hard actually to figure out who is a unique author because there's so many people called Zhang. And so they, they realize that this is practically an insoluble problem, particularly in Scopus, which does a very poor job of disambiguating names. And so then they're left with a, a you know, still rather large group of around 900 apparently true hyper 
authors. And so from that, they found 265 that they reached out to and 81 of them replied. Now, this is where it really gets interesting because then these people who wrote back and the questions were, tell us how it is that you publish a paper every five days. Like, what is your secret? Like, I, inquiring minds would like to know. I would like to know. Because I'm like six papers a year. I'm super psyched. I was like, that was a good year. But these guys are like off the charts, right? And, and, you know, not surprisingly, they do it by not satisfying the Vancouver criteria, which Mm. is like, what do you need to do to have claimed legitimate authorship? And most of these guys admitted to the fact they had achieved none of them on any of these papers. And these were all basically written by graduate students. And sometimes they would have read the paper, but not even always that they had actually read the paper and can guarantee it that they know what it was about, but their name is on it. Yeah. I mean, my, my interpretation was it was a little bit different only in that I, I got the sense that these people have their research that they do and they definitely qualify for authorship on those ones. It's just right. they also, in addition, have these sort of uh, research machines that are churning out paper after paper after paper, and it's, it's hard to know whether they're actually able to read all of them. Right. So I thought it, I thought, I thought it was interesting, but what I found maybe most surprising about it is, is how many of these hyperprolific authors who admitted to not really following the Vancouver standards bemoaned the lack of adherence to the Vancouver standards and said that they really, people really should be doing that. Yep. Though I confess, I am not. And so I was like, ha. Well, yep. um, anyway, I, I, I don't really imagine that I'm going to have this problem in no, my future. I, I suspect none of us around this table are ever going to have that problem. I could be so lucky. Hmm? All right. But so here's the best part, which is that my amazing and amusing goes in the exact opposite oh, direction. Cool. So you didn't also do this paper by mistake because that would have been terrible. I did not. I did not. But I did check your email. You will see. I sent you this yesterday. Oh, I believe you. <laughs> anyway. Uh, how many articles have you written that have been cited by exactly zero people? Oh, well, probably several. Most of my articles. Most are. of them. Yeah. So um, there is this feeling out there that there are lots and lots of papers that are essentially go to the, the citation graveyard and never, ever get cited. So this is a paper from uh, – it's not a paper. It's an article from Nature – uh, from 2017, Richard Van Norden wrote an article on the science that's never been cited. Ooh. Uh, and they, they dug into the, the actual numbers on the number of papers that, that ever go uncited. And turns out it's not probably as bad as many people thought it was. Um, so they looked at, uh, uh about 12,000 journals and that are published that get recorded in the web of science for the number of zero citation papers. Um, Web of Science records suggest that fewer than 10% of scientific articles are likely to remain unsighted ever. Does that make you feel better or worse? <laughs> that, that's a fair amount, frankly. 10%? Yeah. Sure, but I mean, I think that people thought it was much more than that. And it's been getting better over time, because partly because... The number of citations per paper has been going up over time. So over time, they balloon from about an average of about 20 citations to about 40 citations per right. paper. Um, and therefore, the number of cite, the number of papers that never get cited has been dropping from, I think it was about 15% down to, or 20%-ish down to about 10%, which I thought was... That's not bad. ...was was pretty interesting. But, um, but there's some bias. Like, some some of us are, like, hyper-producers of, of irrelevant <laughs> research. So you're the, the, the exact opposite of the hyper... <laughs> that could be me, for right, example. Right, And, and some of us cite themselves repeatedly the in order to prevent, I get a citation. Well, that's the, that's the perfect way to present ever having right. an uncited paper is just cite yourself. Make right. sure. Oof. So yeah, so it's dropped from about 25% percent of papers in the 1980s to about 10 percent in 2005 which i thought was interesting and they presented a couple of um but do they control for self-citation no oh no not at all they 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 did um present a couple of anecdotes which i thought were interesting so the one was uh this was a researcher named albert peck whose 1926 paper characterizing a kind of defect in glass attracted its first citation in 2014 wow yeah wow what was the defect (laughs) <laughs> I do not know. I didn't look at the article. Okay. Um, anyway, I just, I, thought, I just thought it was interesting to know that huh. if uh, I now go back and look at all my papers that have had zero citations, it better be less than 10%. Well, as you were, as you were, you know, doing, going into your, your, your uh, monologue here, uh, I was thinking like, w- which of my papers is probably most, most irrelevant. And I, and I wrote which this. Which is the most never cited? Most irrelevant. And the one, the one that I was thinking of initially was this paper I wrote with David Hamer called Doc, There's a Worm in My Stool, which I thought actually was a great paper. It was about a patient with Munchausen syndrome who faked 
like intestinal parasitosis. Um, anyway, we wrote this up as a case of Munchausen's disease. And, and I, I, I just found it has actually been cited 13 times. Well done. I'd like to know who those people are. So I will can, find out. But You can go find them. All right. Well, that is the end of our program. If you have any feedback on this or any other episode, or you want to suggest a study or a topic for us to take on, you can tweet us at at PopHealthEx, or you can tweet me at at ProfMattFox, or you can tweet Chris at at ID.Gill, or you can tweet Don at DTheo1, or you can find us on the Population Health Exchange website, which is at www.pophealthex.org. We want to thank Leslie Talalian, Director of Lifelong Learning at BU School of Public Health, for supporting the podcast, and Nick Guler for sound and editing. Thanks for joining us. We hope you enjoyed it, and we hope you will go out and download that next episode. <laughs>